Hello and welcome everybody to this um, vlog of sorts. Today is the um, actually, today is the 30th of May in 2020. In about an hour, the I think first manned SpaceX mission will start. If the mission is a success, this date will have absolutely no meaning. If it if it ends in a disaster, though, this video here will be. Uh, sort of a historic relic. Think about that for a moment. Uh, we go away from space uh, to a more earthly topic, paleontology. This part of the video is sort of a prologue for what I am about to do tomorrow with my girlfriend. We are going to the Dinosaur Museum in Frick, Argau, which is about uh, a 30 minute drive away from here. Now, however, I am just uh, alone in my room. My girlfriend is not behind the camera. I am instead testing out my new tripod. It feels weird to just not to just uh, talk to nobody, to just uh, this one like unfeeling eye of the camera. So excuse me if I <laughs> right, like right now like excuse me if I get like stuck in my monologue and don't know what to say because it feels a bit weird. I need to get used to that. Uh, what I am doing I will do now is just uh, tell you what to, to expect tomorrow what Frick is what this museum is known for and what dinosaurs uh, we might see t tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> and the, the, the Dinosaur Museum in Frick is uh, comparatively new. It was first built in 1991, but it, it was based around uh, fossil finds which were made all the way back in the 70s. And Frick is notable because uh, in this place uh, were found some of the most complete and largest skeletons of the dinosaur Plateosaurus. Plateosaurus is um, um, probably a well-known dinosaur. It was it lived in the late Triassic. It was one of the first dinosaurs. It is what older books especially usually call a prosauropod so something that looked a bit like a sauropod but was not quite there yet and nowadays of course the, the meaning of and the word prosauropod is kind of an informal name that is not used anymore in cladistics the reason is of course that true sauropods you know like brachiosaurus brontosaurus and stuff descent from animals we would call prosauropods which means some prosauropods are more closely related to sauropods than they are to other prosauropods so as you so you get it uh, the definition of prosauropod is kind of superficial and i'm tired of using this word now uh, the more the now more accurate name for sauropods and their close relatives is sauropodomorpha which is the sister group of theropoda which are the carnivorous uh, bipedal dinosaurs so uh, the more accurate description of plateosaurus is that it is a basal sauropodomorph and like in in the rare case that you don't know what so Plateosaurus really looks like, I just want to show you some good images and tell you a bit about the history of this dinosaur and also some artistic conventions. Wait, let me. Uh, the book I'm holding right now is uh, Archosauria by John C. McLaughlin. It's a book from 1976. No, no. 1979, so very late 70s, and it's very notable for being like one of the first books that speculatively uh, depicted dinosaurs with feathers. Here, that's a nice image of Zoellurus with feathers by McLaughlin. Keep in mind, this was like all still speculation back then. But we are not here for this fellow, we are here for the ear, Plateosaurus. And as you can see here, there is like there is a, there are many images from this era of paleontology that show Plateosaurus being a very mobile animal. 
And the thing is, probably many people don't know this about Platysaurus, it's a, a dinosaur that has been long, known for a very long time. It was first discovered by, in 1834 by Friedrich Philipp Engelhardt, I think that was the name. <laughs> no. Yeah, that was his name, or it is his name, yeah, of course, because Platius, the type species of Platiosaurus is called Platiosaurus Engelharti. And just to give you perspective of how early in dinosaur science this was, 1834, this was like just 10 years after Megalosaurus and Iguanodon were first described, the very first dinosaurs. However, at the time, Platiosaurus was not yet uh, really recognized as a dinosaur and was not included in the definition of Dinosauria by Richard Owen, but later it was recognized to be a dinosaur and one uh, an early ancestor of the large sauropod kinds of dinosaurs. Now, uh, now ever since uh, Platysaurus has been discovered, there has been a big debate about how it actually like walked and stood in life. Like I think the first one of the first reconstructions of the dinosaur actually showed it as a bipedal digitigrade animal like a bird and the, I think that was also like the opinion of many prominent Amer American paleontologists when they looked at the relatives of Patiosaurus like Ankylosaurus. But then were, there were other scientists, I think mainly German ones. Yeah, I, sh I should have, met, have mentioned that before. Platiosaurus was first discovered in, by Engelhardt in Nuremberg in Bavaria. It's uh, mainly a Central European dinosaur. Well, well, is what I want to say with that. Anyway, there were also like suggestions that the, this dinosaur like crawled on all fours with splayed legs, you know, like a lizard and. There were even like suggestions that it hopped like a kangaroo. And of course, like as you can see here from the 70s onwards, I have another there's many interesting depictions of it. It's like sort of a paleo art trope where they show platiosaurus being really flexible in how it could have walked. Like Here, yeah, this is from the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs. I think many people will know this book. It's like one of the John Zibik's, the illustrator's uh, first breakthroughs, and like many images in it are like on, as you can see here, and in the other book, uh, a common trend in the 80s, 90s, 70s was to depict uh, two plateosaurs next to each other, one standing on all fours and one standing on just two legs, often like really upright, like a a human in a Godzilla zoo. And, um, and of course it was thought that because uh, when you look at the legs of Platiosaurus it looks very obviously like it could have stood on two legs, but because it was also thought to have been one of the early like ancestors of sauropods, which are all quadrupeds, uh, it was reasoned that uh, this animal could switch between the two and at some point it just decided to stay quadrupedal and th that's how the sauropods basically came into existence. However, in 2007 a new study found out that Platiosaurus was incapable of pronating its wrists. Like pronating means like when you can turn your wrists down like this and like from beginning with the 2000s onward it was discovered that not many dinosaurs could do this movement. Like we humans can obviously do it, uh, cats can do it, raccoons, they, many climbing animals in general can do it, but many dinosaurs could not. Their hands are always in this, like imagine like a, a, f a typical three-fingered dinosaur hand, the thumb, digit one, digit two, uh, the digit two, th digit three, sorry. <laughs> and, they could not pronate the wrist, the, the hands would have always faced each other like this, so they could snatch up prey pretty easily. In the case of the carnivorous dinosaurs. But as I said, in 2007, 
it was also discovered that Platyosaurus was also incapable of doing this movement, so it could not have placed its hands on the ground like this to walk on all fours. Instead, it was um, an obli what we call an obligate biped, like it had to walk permanently on its two legs, like we do, or like most uh, carnivorous dinosaurs did. Uh, so while many of our popular depictions of plateosaurs are outdated now, it, the idea that early sauropodomorphs could, that some early sauropodomorphs could uh, switch between bipedal and quadrupedal motion is not untrue. For example, uh, plateosaurs had a small uh, American relative called Ankyosaurus. Let me see here, there is a nice depiction of this dinosaur here in good old Bobby Barker's book. Here, here he depicted the Ankyosaurus upright and showing off its claws to its zoelophysis in a manner very similar to like how modern ant eater stands up and shows its claws to like a jaguar. And we think that Ankyosaurus could switch between quadrupedal and bipedal motion. Then there is an, a very weird example from a South African sauropodomorph called Massospondylus. Not Manospondylus, like my brother, Massospondylus, with two S. Which, like when we, which is a very well-known uh, early sauropodomorph. We even found eggs and uh, juveniles of this dinosaur. And what we found out that is that while the adults are very much like Platyosaurus in that they can only stand and walk on two legs, the juveniles look like mini sauropods, meaning they could walk on four legs, but when they grew up, uh, basically the hands like lost their mobility and became grasping appendages. And they could not walk on all four legs anymore. And it is now thought that true sauropods, you know, the big ones, uh, came to be to, through a process called neoteny, which is when an adult animal retains traits from the juvenile stage. You know, like the axolotl, which is basically a giant tadpole that somehow uh, managed to still be an adult. And in a similar way, it is thought that sauropods came to de descend from an early sauropodomorph, which somehow was uh, able to retain this quadrupedality into its adult life, which allowed it, of course, to grow much larger because four legs give more stability than two legs. Um, yeah, what did I... Uh, if you ask yourself, if you ask yourself what this bone is, it's not a fossil. This is just a sheep bone. I hope. Uh, which I found some, on some uh, lawn in Turkey, the country, not the bird. To get uh, to get back at uh, Platyosaurus, uh, it and its close relatives are notable for being like among the earliest large dinosaurs and being actually the first. Uh, it was just a bird. Uh, uh, <laughs> There's a, there's a, there are a couple of small birds just outside my window, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, anyway, uh, Platysaurus was one of the... was up to that point, up to that point of its existence, probably the largest herbivorous animal that had existed in Earth's history on land. Before it, the, the largest herbivorous animals were uh, Synapsids like Dicynodons and uh, Dinocephalians, which were these weird proto mammal like creatures of the Permian and early Triassic. 
and there were also a Perea source which were somewhat tortoise like um, parareptiles, I think is the correct name. But, we, but only the fewest of these animals reached uh, hippo size, most were like the size of pigs. Uh, but, and Plateosaurus was like the first animal that reached like giraffe or elephant size. And uh, in the latest press, the first sauropods also showed up, which like exceeded even those sizes. And of course, the most titanic creatures the Earth had ever seen would then start appearing in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. But what I want to say about this is uh, Plateosaurus and its relatives are like the first really successful radiation of dinos of a dinosaur group. Of course there were dinosaurs before Plateosaurus, you know like Hererasaurus, Eoraptor, Savicosaurus, but none of those dinosaurs were yet really like dominant in their niche or in their environment up all the way to the end of the Triassic. The true rulers of Earth were the, the Pseudosuchians, which were which were relatives of dinosaurs, but they were on the in the Archosaur family tree. They were like on the line that would lead to crocodiles, while dinosaurs were, of course, on the line that would lead to birds. So basically, you had all these weird uh, croco -li crocodile-like creatures running around in the Triassic. Some look, some were herbivorous, some were carnivorous, some were probably in between and some looked uh, an awful lot like dinosaurs like it's, there were many that could walk on two legs there were some bizarre armored forms that uh, ki kind of uh, predicted uh, ankylosaurs and stegosaurs without being uh, related to them there were there was even one soyosuchian called um, what was his name Ephidia, which actually had like a toothless beak and long legs and almost looked like an ornithomimid dinosaur from the Cretaceous but it was actually and it looked uh, a lot like a bird but it was actually more closely related to crocodiles than to any of those groups. Then there were also very bizarre forms like Lotosaurus which was a quadrupedal herbivore with a beak and also like a sail on the back, similar to maybe Dimetrodon or Spinosaurus. But uh, at the end of the Triassic, most of these weird forms died out, and only the Pseudosuchi line, which was crocodilians and their closest relatives, would survive into the Jurassic and into modern times. And, uh, of course, by the end of the Triassic, the first sauropodomorphs were getting successful, the first theropods were getting successful, the first ornithischians probably showed up. Uh, it's actually currently uh, a bit unsure uh, when the first ornithischians start appearing because many of the oldest uh, animals we fought were the first ornithischians, later turned out to be something else like. Silesaurids, which are dinosaur forms, which aren't real dinosaurs yet. So there is like this new hypothesis that the first Ornithischians uh, first started appearing in the early Jurassic and that they actually descend from theropods, but that is uh, still a very controversial uh, suggestion and it remains to be seen how that evolves. On the topic of other dinosaur groups than Plateosaurus, uh, Frick is also no well known for having a dinosaur that is so far only unique to Switzerland, which is a small theropod called Nota Tesseraptor. And there aren't many paleo artistic pi uh, pictures of it yet, uh, so the best I can do to show you how you can imagine this animal is show you a picture of Zoelophysis, which was which was a small uh, Triassic theropod. It was probably somewhat closely related to like not the, they were not 
the closest relatives. Here you can see it. They were not the closest relatives, but like something like this is what Notatesseraptor probably looked like. If it had feathers like this uh, image of the of Isis, uh, we don't know. We don't actually we don't know when feathers in the dinosaur family tree first start appearing yet. But it's possible that it started appearing in the Triassic. Probably, like there have even recently been suggestions that uh, the pycnophyrus, those hair-like uh, structures that grow that grew on the skin of pterosaurs, were early feathers, which would mean that the common ancestors of dinosaurs and pterosaurs already had a form of proto feathers. And there was, was also a recent study which showed. Well, not that recent, but a couple of years ago, it showed that uh, the skews on the skins of crocodiles and the feathers of birds are homologous, meaning they derive from the same structure. That doesn't mean that the earliest ancestors of crocodiles had feathers, but it could mean that uh, their skews derived from a structure that was maybe similar. Which is, think, think about uh, what the fast crocodile could look like, that would be really weird. Would, uh, that, uh, and I don't think there are uh, any images of paleo artists imagining such a uh, possibility. Though as I mentioned earlier, there are, there were, are, um, there were pseudosuchians, like close relatives of crocodiles in the Triassic, which not only looked bird-like, but probably were uh, warm-blooded or endothermic, which means they would have required something to insulate the body so they wouldn't lose their self-generated body heat, which could kind of give credit to the idea that even this crocodile line of archosaurs possessed feathers. But again, there is no evidence for this yet, that's just speculation mostly on my part. Yeah, I think yeah. we are uh, now at the Tongrube in Frick, where you can uh, <laughs> where you can uh, chop out your own fossils. And look here, Miranda just found her first ammonite. Yeah. I don't know. Honey. Are you proud of me? Yeah, I am. Honey, you have to say I more am very stuff. Yeah, and it's great. <laughs> it's, it's small but great. The question is if you can get it out around the rock. Yeah, you can try. Or if try you have that. to carry the whole stone. Let me see. You could try. <laughs> Take I could it try, out. yes. I, I, I'm just scared I will damage it in the process. You don't have to feel me. Oh. Okay, now. What did you find? Oh no, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I thought it was like a fish. Show me. I think that's the imprint of a shell of a clam mm. again. Okay. I'll go look there. Now we are inside the museum and here we see Nota Tesseraptor, the very first like originally Swiss dinosaur and as you see I didn't lie, it looks a lot like Pseudophysis. Here you see this little Tuatara that's here because inside the stomach of this dinosaur they found this lizard. Well it's not really mm -hmm. a lizard but it's a relative of lizards. Like you. Thank you. Here we see the skull of Tlachiosaurus. I think that's even a like, lower jaw of teeth are here. You see all these chisel shaped teeth. Yeah, they're, they're very similar to like what you would find in a modern plant eating reptile, like an iguana. They weren't really good at chewing like we or other mammals do, but uh, they did the job. But they were mostly like made to strip off leaves and cut them off. But they also are the same. That's the complete fossil. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. What? Of Platiosaurus oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. So that one. Yeah. And I said earlier that there was like this old paintwork show to show, show like two Platiosaurus next to each other. One stands up on two legs and one like walks on four feet. And of course today we know that it couldn't walk on four feet, it was an obligate bike. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. But of course this mural was made before that was found out. The museum was first built in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Here we see a juvenile plateosaur. I think it's called Fabian. Yeah, that's right, it's, that's the name of this one, Fabian. <laughs> and this here is Proganocalis, which is one of the oldest known turtles. Ever, like it was the oldest known turtle in Switzerland and among the oldest turtles. There, there were a few that were older and more primitive. But as you can see here, it already looks a lot like a modern turtle with the shell, with the hands. But it, you see here, it has like a bit of an armored tail, kind of like an ankylosaur, and it has like this armored spice coming out of the shell. And it also had. Come here, look. See, it had these spikes along the back of the ne neck. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it already lacked all teeth like a modern turtle. Mm -hmm. Oh, here, look, it's a uh, Burian. It's the reconstruction by Stenek Burian. Nice. Should I cut? Maybe I can start this. And here you see, I think. Yeah, I think it's made out of real fossils of the dinosaur, uh, the full mounted skeleton of Platinosaurus in a heart in the somewhat Viking to the bush. And it was found where? Here, in Frick. Like right next to the mine. Like, what is, how do you say this? Tongue, I can't remember. Yeah, yes, mining spot, I don't know. Yeah. Let's go upstairs. It's filming. Okay. And dinosaurs are not the only things found here. I think most of the Triassic and Jurassic deposits here are marine because back in the day, like all throughout the Mesozoic, Switzerland and a lot and many other parts of Central and South Europe were underwater or islands, so it was very tropical. And here we can see uh, ammonites which were very abundant during the Mesozoic. I mean, I, I, think, I don't have to explain this, were uh, several pots, so they had like tentacles and eyes coming out of you like a squid. And here you can see balamites too, which were also squid relatives, but they had this, their shell internalized, and it, look, and it looked, and in life they would have looked like modern like squids, you like, like calamars, but that's something, that's something, calamari. But is calamari the one? The, is calamari the thing you eat, or is calamari? I think the... yes. <laughs> oh look, these are vertebrate fossils. But, but from what? Uh, the first one. Oh, that's the. That's the rib of like some marine reptile. It doesn't say what. And almost all the rest is from. Except this one. The rest is from ichthyosaurs. Oh look here, this like, the like bones of an ichthyosaur. Like I think the rib. Alongside the other forces of like ammonites and shells, and these here are shark teeth. And here we see fish saurier fossil. Like fish saur is the German term for ichthyosaurs. It's like a literal translation. Uh, so this one. This is yeah, it's the skull. Mm -hmm. like, can you? I think this. The eye would be. Yeah, ah. th those are like. The, I think that's like the top view of the skull, and that's yeah. the eyes. Ah, uh -huh, yeah, that, that would make sense. Yeah. Or no, I think that's like the. I think this would have been. Yeah, no, that. I think that's the eye, and this is like this uh, fenestra. And 
here uh, we see forces from the Lias, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is, I believe it's the early Jurassic. Has a whole... Can we touch this? I don't want to touch it. I don't it. think so. But look at this, we have, we have like this giant ammonite, but also this giant clan. Oh wow, yeah, that's really yeah. big. And this is actually not the... There actually used to be clans much larger than this during the Cretaceous in the Western Interior Sea way of North America. Uh, there was a clan which was called Duokeram, no, not Duokeramus. Um, what's it? Something Keramus. <laughs> you can insert it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, anyway, it was like two meters wide, a giant clan. Imagine a giant two meter size clan that opened up like this. And imagine a fish swam between those and the clam shut down accidentally. We actually find many fossils like that of fish inside these giant clams that were accidentally trapped. Wow. <laughs> I think looking at you instead of the camera is best. Um, no, but I think you, did, you do notice it. Yeah. And make a picture of that. Uh, I, I cut now. Okay. I'll cut now. One. Ready? Okay. Here we see a couple of other fossils found in the, I think, in the same tomb group as the one we have just been to. Yeah, it looks like yeah. something yeah, we found. See, see, as you can see here, uh, an ammonite shell is hollow and the animal usually only occupied the frontmost segment of the shell and the rest was filled with air. And ammonites could compress the air inside the shell to either sink or uh, swim up mm. and that's how they control their buoyancy which is uh, oh, wow. yeah and there are a couple of like modern cephalopods that still do this like of course the nautiloids which were very primitive but i believe also sepias the or i think in english they are called cuttlefish they do the same mm -hmm. did you have your finger on the microphone again? no no i don't think so <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> yes I... <laughs> and here we see i believe uh, these are minerals, but this looks like this, uh, an ammonite imprint that has been like mineralized by some quartz. Yeah, I think this is what I found before. Yes. Look, this is amazing. That's a giant brachiopod. I love brachiopods. Is that? Please tell me that's a brachiopod. Oh, and this nice oh, shell. This is so pretty. Oh no, that's a Nautilus. <laughs> no. But these are brachiopods, I love. Them. Are you making a video or? Yeah. Oh, you're I'm still recording. Oh, you're still recording, sorry. Oh, look, fossilized wood. Yeah, even have that. Nice. Yeah. Yes. You, what? you want me to take a few pictures? Yeah, I'm not put now then. Pictures. <laughs> Is that all? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yes. I'm recording. Uh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we are now back at my home. We unfortunately could not uh, film a lot uh, while we were uh, working at the club, but because we were, of course, busy uh, chopping up rocks and finding and identifying fossils. So. Uh, but we still found a lot of stuff which I just want to present here. And the first fossil we found was this one, which we found finally enough on our way, on the path to the Klopfplatz. And I believe it is the Brachiopod. Brachiopods are marine creatures still alive today, though they aren't that as numerous as they once were. They're, they look like a lot like clams, but they, they are not closely related to them. The main difference between brachiopods and clams is that a clam basically is an animal that has a left and right shell that it closes like this, though it always lies on its side most of the time. But a brachiopod is an animal that has an, has an upper and a lower shell that it closes like this. And I'm not, I don't think the, this is the type of brachiopod that had it, but uh, many brachiopods also have like a, a tail-like appendage that comes out of the back with which they attach themselves to the seafloor. 
Then we also found this, which I believe is also a brachiopod based on the shape. Though it, the way it kind of curves, it could also be a clam. It is a very similar fossil where we, we see the, the shell was broken off here and what we can see here, this very smooth part was like the infilling of mud that formed inside the fossil. One of my favorite finds was made by my girlfriend holding the camera, which is this imprint of an ammonite shell mm -hmm. right next to a pea, something which I believe is fossilized wood, like probably fossilized uh, driftwood from some island in the Mesozoic. We found a lot of imprints like this, like here we see probably the imprint of a, a, another clam shell. Well, this here I believe is like a, a genuine shell I found. Basically, we found a lot of plants. <laughs> here. here we see, we, many mm -hmm. people may not know this, but you see this uh, outline here that's like a, a cross section of a clam shell. Like, imagine a clam lying like this in the mud, and then you cut it through this way, and that's what you would see. And if you live in a building with if a lot of um, Marble? Marble, yeah, what is it that's Marble. called? Mar no, mar in English. Marble. Mar ah, marble, sorry. I thought you were uh, speaking French. <laughs> marble. No. Yeah, if you live in a building with a lot of marble, you may actually see these um, forms inside the rock. And when you see that, it's very probably a fossilized clam shell. Keep that in mind when you look at your floor next step. What have we found here? Oh, there is like another shell inside here. Yeah, oh, it's basically just imprints of clams here. Oh no, wait, here is also like a genuine clam eroding out of the rock here. Mm. It's a bit broken off, but... I yeah, mean, the black thing. Yeah, yeah. Looking out of there, the black thing. Here we see another brachiopod. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is like the biggest shell fragment I found. I think you can see this from this angle even. See this? This used to be like the part of a clamshell that broke off. Here we again have uh, imprints from ammonite shells. So like an ammonite once sat on this part of the rock, but it fell out and probably someone else already took it before us. You have to sh show it more because oh, you cannot see it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you have to insert a clip of it later because yeah. you can't re really see it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything I forgot? Oh yeah, here this is like a clam, another clam shell, but it's surrounded by a nodule of fossilized clay. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a that's a really nice imprint of another ammonite shell. Yeah, this one you can see. Someone was uh, quicker than us again. And here this is, oh, this is also a nice shell fragment again. Of course, like the, those really nice museum specimens that you see, like in documentaries and stuff, like these whole, uh, whole ass ammonites and trilobites and stuff. That, that you, it depends on the locality, but uh, most of the time you don't find them as complete as that, as you can see in our ones. Or uh, we are just really bad at finding fossils. Yeah. My, my girlfriend was a bit upset that uh, most of what we found were just clams and uh, brachiopods, but it didn't really upset me because I find, even though the, well, then of course dinosaurs are a bit more interesting, I still find uh, 
invertebrates like that very fascinating. Especially like uh, brachiopods for being... When you look at their biology, they're like very weird animals and I really like them for that, but most people, even in paleontology, find them boring. But I like... But I... I don't know why. I, I just always find them cute. Three. Uh, like I mentioned before, brachiopods used to be a lot more common in the past, especially in the Paleozoic, before the age of dinosaurs. But then the Permian-Triassic mass extinction happened, which wiped out most uh, genera of brachiopods, which, and this vacuum then allowed clams uh, to take over. However, if the, the mass extinction itself was the cause of this, is kind of a debated question. Another reason might be that clams simply are ecologically more uh, variable than brachiopods because mo most what brachiopods can do is uh, like hang in the water attached to a stalk like this and filter the water. And, <laughs> and while uh, many clams uh, do the same, they, are, they, have, they can move a lot more, they can they can eat a lot more, they have a lot more available lifestyles. There is a wasp at my foot. <laughs> yeah, for example, uh, clams can dig themselves into the, into the sea floor, which most brachiopods cannot. Um, clams can also like, um, not just filter feed, but they also have like this um, trunk-like feeding organs, which they can vacuum the sea floor and all that uh, type of stuff. There are even uh, clams which uh, are able to uh, eat wood, I believe, or a uh, type of crab, I'm not sure anymore. Uh, I'll put something here that says if I was right or wrong. <laughs> uh, get back to the museum in which we were. It was, while it was small, it was very nicely arranged and designed. It was cute, like uh, many things we saw. Uh, what I didn't get to talk about in the clip before was the crinoid exhibit the uh, museum had. I'll probably put some pictures here uh, of that, um, which uh, was very nice and extensive. And even there was there was even like a little chart that explained crinoid biology. Uh, every time, like I've seen in multiple times where people saw like crinoid fossils and thought it was a plant. And yeah, a crinoid kind of looks like a a palm tree, a little, like a mini palm tree, but in reality it's an animal that is uh, somewhat closely related to starfish, uh, sea urchins sea, and sea cucumbers. And uh, very, like, uh, they were, they, like brachiopods during the Paleozoic, they were very successful. Oh, the, the wasp landed on uh, her feet now. <laughs> It's okay. They were, used to be very, very successful, but then the Triassic, Permian Triassic mass extinction also hit them hard, and they were mostly replaced by other animals. They still are alive today, but most brachiopod and uh, echinoderms, that, uh, not echinoderms, that's the final. Crinoids? Uh, crinoids, crinoids, sorry. Most crinoids uh, alive today are of a type that. Um, that can either like crawl uh, across the sea floor a bit or which can s freely swim. So in so mostly these the, the types which can like flee from predators and it is thought that uh, one major factor in like the demise of crinoids was the evolution of uh, marine animals, mostly marine reptiles like placodus or henodus which were able to eat uh, hard shelled food. So even animals, what are you looking at? Oh, nothing. I, I thought it, it looked like you were looking at no, some no, like, no. like uh, West Indian python approaching me <laughs> my back. So no, sorry, you got lost. You, you just drifted off into sleep, sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, but if, yeah, like basically uh, someone in the Triassic it just simply wasn't viable anymore for many animals to have a hard shell because uh, the predators uh, adapted to this hard shell, so they, many animals had to invent new types to escape predation, like burrowing or swimming, or going extinct. <laughs>
then you also don't have a problem. Yeah. So uh, this concludes our little expedition to Frick. It was a, a nice celebration of my 22nd birthday and I, I really look uh, forward to revisiting Frick someone in the future. Until then, however, I have other plans um, <laughs> like uh, revisiting the, uh, the other major dinosaur museum in Switzerland, the one in Atal, which is owned by the Sieber family, which uh, owns uh, its own excavation site in the Morrison Formation in Wyoming. And I also want to go to Ticino in southern Switzerland, where they have a they have a, also a major dinosaur museum and also a little excavation site which is called, I believe, the Triassic Park because of all the Triassic fossils that are found there. Until then, however, um, wasps everywhere. Uh, until then, however, I will get eaten by wasps. This is the end of the video. Bye. <laughs>